and a wonderful afternoon to your listeners and viewers of this channel. Uh, I will continue with the self-evolving cosmos and chapter five of Stephen M. Rosen. And I will try to make some more illustrations of this rather difficult subject. Presently at page 99 on all pages. It's the last paragraph, and we just spoke about holiness with W, or and or, I'll have to say, H, holiness. The whole, as in Make a whole is foundational for holiness, for something to be whole. This is also connected to health. And think also with unity. There can be no unity without oppositions. As clearly shown, all opposing sides make the cube makes the cube or make the cube it is without opposing sides sides that cannot be seen there will be no cube dimensionality always have the concept of non-visibility or covering up it's a feature of having dimensions having depth better appreciate the threefold distinction among the Möbius line. The Möbius surface and the Klein bottle. Let us consider the simpler case of three non-paradoxical counterparts. The circle, the cylindrical ring, which I have one here, and the torus, think of a do not. We know that the cylindrical ring taken as an object in three dimensional space is an open surface possessing two edges or bounding circles. This surface can be topologically transformed into a closed structure by elongating it, stretching it to form a tube. And then bringing the circular edges of this tube together. The second part of this operation is identical to that depicted in the upper row. The closed surface that results is the torus, the do not. Now 
now if we proceed in the other direction narrowing the cylindrical ring instead of elongating it the circular edges draw closer and closer together in the limit we obtain but a single circle The two-dimensional open surface, having been reduced to one-dimensional closed line. Consider now parallel operations upon the Möbius counterpart of the cylindrical ring like the cylinder and the movie strip is an open surface one that locally possesses a pair of edges If the Möbius were a stretch in a manner similar to the elongation of the cylindrical ring, and if its edges were glued together, we would obtain the Klein bottle. Of course, joining the edges of the Möbius strip is not so easy, given the odd one-edgedness of this structure. Edges twist together to form a single edge. In fact, we are unable to execute the operation in three-dimensional space without tearing the surface, an action that topology does not permit. are seeing is that the topological operation of identifying opposing edges of the Möbius strip is equivalent to that which we considered earlier. and which is shown in the lower row. The end circles of an elongated tube are joined from inside the tube's body. A procedure requiring the tube to pass through itself and thus to produce an impermissible breach when attempting to assemble the Klein bottle 
has an object in three-dimensional space. Moreover, identification of the opposing edges of a single Möbius strip is also equivalent to gluing together two Möbius strips of opposite orientation. We saw above that the latter operation yields the Klein bottle as well. Now suppose, instead of elongating the Möbius strip, we made it narrower. What would happen in the limit of this operation? Would we obtain a simple circle as with a cylindrical ring, a simply closed line of a single dimension? To see what would actually result from this operation Let us compare the perceptual reduction of the cylindrical and Möbius strips in three-dimensional space. Figure 5-7 illustrates the fact that we three-dimensional observers can rotate a cylindrical ring in such a manner that only one of its edges is visible. In this way, the ring is perceptually reduced from a two-dimensional surface to a one-dimensional circle. It is clear from inspection of the Mebius that no such reduction is possible. The one-dimensional, one-edged view obtainable over the full length of the cylindrical ring can be realized in the Möbius case only at a cross-section of the strip. Note, moreover, 
that in viewing the Nibias in this edgewise function, fashion, we do not actually see the cross-sectional line itself, but just the end point of this line that is nearest to us. Illustrated in figure 57B by point P. It is the equivalence of this point. However, we position the Nibius, however we rotate it in three-dimensional space, at any given moment, no more than a single point will be visible to us on the Mobius edge, at which extension in two dimensions will have vanished. It is only at this singular point that the perspective, perspectival opposition of sides is, in effect, perceptually neutralized. Thus, the attempt to reduce the Möbius strip perceptually to a simple circle a one-dimensional purely positive presence in three-dimensional space is frustrated by an unavoidable dialectical surplus. Hmm. This is indeed very important. The very wish for a one-dimensional Mobius strip will give a dialectical surplus. I'd say that could be compared to a trace that you cannot wash away. In the dimensional reduction thus far considered, only the properties of topological objects in three-dimensional space have been affected, not the characteristics of space itself. or those of the observer. Suppose instead of merely reducing the dimension of our objects, we were able to change the whole dimensional frame of observation, lower the dimensionality of object in space before subject. How good. We would then obtain the flatland state of affairs that wherein space itself is two-dimensional. environment 
the cylindrical surface would indeed become a circular line. But a line with peculiar properties when compared with our three dimensional perception of lines. Just as we three-dimensional observers cannot fully view both sides of a surface at once, but must experience them in perspectival opposition, the flatland observer would not be able to view both edges of the circle at once. On Krauspensky, this would not mean that the flatlander would simply be limited to perceiving but a single edge of the circle. Rather, the flatlander would experience the edges of the circular line in a perspectively oppositional fashion, aching to the way we three-dimensional observers experience the sides of the toroidal surface. This dialectic of edges is certainly not detectable in the three-dimensional environment wherein lines are viewed in a strictly juxtapositional manner. And I think there's an important point there. When I entered education, we all had present the one-dimensionality of of the Uspensky viewpoint. Therefore, all books I read and all theories I received were to be non-dimensional, by default, unavoidable. And I would say this is a phenomenon that goes all through society. We are all inclined to do that. That is our heritage or our inheritance, like a DNA, we will immediately sort of undimensionalize whatever we learn, whatever we hear, make it flat, like the flatlanders. I think that's why Uspensky is such a good example. He is not coming from academia, but he still has the view of the flatness well established. But we must take note of an essential difference between Kleinian and Möbial orders of dimensional depth.
the Kleinian interplay of subject and object is more complex than its Mebius counterpart. In, in the three-dimensional Kleinian container, whatever the content of experience, all perception is framed by three degrees of dimensional differentiation. Three kinds of bounding elements, planes, lines and points. Contra Uspensky. This would not mean that the flatlander would simply be li limited to perceiving but a single edge of the circle. Rather, the flatlander would experience the edges of the circular line in, and this is most important, in a perspectively or positional fashion, aching to the way we, three dimensional observers, experience the sides of the toroidal surface. The dialectics are embedded in spatiality. This dialectic of edges is certainly not detectable in the three-dimensional environment where lines are viewed in a strictly juxtapositional manner. Now, in the foregoing dimensional reduction, the open-edged edged cylindrical surface is transformed into a circular flat line line whose properties of closure is aching to that of the torus. The higher order counterpart of the cylinder in three dimensional space. Similarly, the dimensional reduction of the open edged Möbius band would yield a flat land, flat land line whose structure would correspond to the band's higher order counterpart versus the Klein bottle. Unlike the open Möbius surface, the Möbius line would be both open and closed. That is, both open and closed. I think that's impossible to understand without carefully feeling the Möbius strip. How could that be possible? Well, you can see it. It is definitely possible. Assuming then that the flatland Möbius 
takes on the role played by the Klein bottle in three-dimensional space. Would a flatline structure exist whose role would correspond to that of the Möbius strip in three space? The topological bisection series tells us that it would be the one-dimensional Lemnitz gate. Recall our study of the two-dimension lemniscatory surface. Through the opposing lobes of this dual structure are linked by continuous movement through its central node. The lemniscate lacks the integrative quality of the one-sided Möbius band whose opposing elements completely overlap one another. The dynamics of dimensional reduction suggests that in flatland the Lemmings gate should lose its duality and assume the integra integrality of the higher order Möbius counterpart. As the Möbius strip is a one-sided surface with an exposed edge, the flatland lemniscate would be a one-edged line with, a, with an exposed point. And just as closing the exposed edge of the Möbius strip forms declining surface, the flatlander would form the Möbius line by closing the exposed point of the linear Lemmings gate. Of course, in each milieu, a self-intersection would be required to complete the closure We have seen that the necessary hole in the Klein bottle bespeaks its unobjectifiability in three dimensional space. Following up on this observation led us to confirm the one sided Klein bottle as the perspectively integrative dialectical circulation of subject, object and space constitutive of the free dimensional life world. A similar conclusion is called for with respect to the Möbius line of flatland. You see here, 
the subject is coming into vision when we have the dialectical circulation most clearly apparent in the Lemmings gate but of course also in the Nervi strip having the Cartesian way with the line and the square will eradicate the subject it will be a juxtaposition in reality and therefore the observer doesn't have a role to play or at least that's what the observer himself thinks above I noted the inability to eliminate the dialecticity of the nervous surface in three-dimensional space the dialectical surplus of uh, opposing Möbius sites in three dimensions betokens the intrinsic edge-wise dialecticity of the Möbius in two-dimensional space this one-edged line would be odd objectifiable in sad space that is it could not be an object in that space so we are standing before an impossibility the necessary gap in the Möbius line would intimate the dialectical spinning together of subject object and space constitutive of the two-dimensional life world to reiterate the Möbius surface is indeed but an object in three-dimensional space a structure that merely symbolizes the dialectic of three-dimensional depth this dialectic can only be truly embodied via the Klein bottle I just have to repeat it is crucial this dialectic can only be truly embodied via the Klein bottle just as the Möbius strip can only be understood by touching it doing it the Klein bottle is crucial to understand the penetration the interpenetration between subject and object if not you would have no choice other than the Cartesian in the open under the fluorescent light that would be your reality or rather you will have to try to make that reality in spite of everything you perceive it would be like a straight jacket on your reality so to speak. what I am suggesting however is that when the Mebius is transposed into its own element when it is given expression in the dimensional milieu of flatland which is the life world of two dimensional space and concomitant to 
dimensional subjectivity, we then have the Möbius line, the unobjectifiable structure that fully embodies the dialectic of two-dimensional depth. But we must take note of an essential difference between Kleinian and Nebial orders of dimensional depth. The Kleinian interplay of subject and object is more complex than its Nebius counterpart. In the three-dimensional Kleinian container, whatever the content of experience, all perception is framed by three degrees of dimensional differentiation, three kinds of bounding elements, planes, lines and points. By contrast, Nebius experience would be limited to just two such terms, lines and points. This would seem to mean that the perception of objects in the flat Nebius life world would be less Different, differentiated that the subject-object dialectic would be weaker in this environment. The perspectivity here, that of edges of the line, should be less sharply defined than the Kleining, Kleinian perspectivity of sides that is familiar to us. Moreover, the dialecticity of the lower dimensional life was should become even weaker as we go further down. The next lowest life world order is that of the Lemmings gate. In three dimensional space, the Lemmings gate is objectively manifested via an open two sided surface. Above, we surmise that. In the two-dimensional milieu, the Lemminscape would function as an open one-edge line analogous to the open one-sided maze of the Möbius surface in three dimensions. A further dimension down, however, the Lemmings gate would enter its own element, the realm of one-dimensional space. Just as the open Möbius surface of three-dimensional space becomes the open and closed self-intersective Möbius line of two dimensions. 
the open Leminskatory line of two-dimensional space would become an open and closed self-intersection point of a one-dimensional life world. If the Kleinian structure constitutes the dialectical circulation of object and object, object and subject, by which the three-dimensional life world is completed in earnest, and if the self-intersecting Möbius structure is the subject-object vortical spin cycle that completes the two-dimensional life world. And that's a tough sentence. It means that there is a circular movement, a vortex, that is the perception of three dimension, as in the Kleinian take. They are all spirals. So when Rosen says it's a vortical spin, it is the vortical spin that goes around, for instance, the cube, that an understanding is in itself a movement. And without said movement, understanding will come to a halt. You can compare this to the previous metaphor of the wave. Trying to stop the wave and saying this is objective reality will stop understanding. As Rosen sees it, that is no understanding at all. It's the halting of a static viewpoint that is no viewpoint. A viewpoint is in itself a spiral waters. It is a movement that spirals. And you can think of the cube. In order to see all sides, you need to move around it. That's the observer taking in all the sides of the cube. And as you understand, this, from the very beginning, includes time not as an extra line somewhere, not a Newtonian T. The spiral is time, but the spiral is also space. There is an inherent spirality, moving tendency in space itself. And I would like to take some example, random one, book by Stephen Fry and it's not hard to see that he wants to keep up this division so that he can have only a sort of unreality, the mythos and he wants to stay in reality and that depicts the one-sidedness of stopping the wave He tries to be a stern believer in what he calls objective scientific reality. But he cannot upkeep it. Because as how Stephen Rosen so clearly showed and can only be understood by touching the Klein bottle. There's no way of understanding it otherwisely. You need to feel what space is. It is down to your perception. Only then you will be able to encompass both sides. And I will call it, it in Stephen Fry's case, it could be to accept mythos and having logos or reality. Seeing them as 
the back side and the front side of the cube. Graham Priest actually he says reality is made up of the possible and the impossible. He calls them gluons in his book One, which is a good read that <laughs> in a much tougher way tries to explain something that parallels what Stephen Rose, Rosen here uh, depicted in a, in, a, in a way that you can actually feel, you can touch. And I think the Klein bottle is necessary here. He will be choosing between those. He can jump over to the other side. That he can do. He can do Bertrand, Bertrand Russell. But he cannot have both. He is already here. Everything has to be in the open, so to speak. And the Klein bottle shows that is not how it works. The subject is interpenetrating to make the real reality of the real. The mythos is involuntarily an accomplice to reality, not something juxtapositioned or next to. Something you can have. I imagine Stephen Fry thinks this book should be on the bookshelf and you read it and then you go out into your real life, <laughs> something of that sort. And this is, of course, uh, the destiny of all my professors in philosophy. They have never touched the Klein bottle. Maybe they somewhere knew about it. You could also see these as the Silla and the Charybdis, or the, the myth. And not that you need to steer free of both, but rather take them both in. And you will then see they are not as monstrous as they originally are perceived as. And Stephen Fry is an Englishman. I will give an English example. There's also a beer called Mythos in Greece. And there used to be a campaign in England called Campaign for Real Aid. And they tried to get rid of beers like Mythos, like lager beers, over carbonated and uh, artificial, not real beers. Actually, what it said, real ale. And that campaign is truly very akin to the mission of Stephen Fry, who travels the whole world to uh, defy what he feels, feels is myth that should be evic ev evicted from reality. Only a world when everything impossible is gone can be a safe world or a sanitized world. Uh, I perfectly well understand his position. We can't be argumented against but what he needs to do is feel the Klein bottle. Now there will be a perceptual realization. At the very foundation, it's about how reality actually is. And misunderstanding of reality, I think, and will always lead to this. And this cannot be resolved. It's a paradox in itself. Resolvement and contradiction are also friends. Whereas here, there is no contradiction, therefore there is no resolvement. And I say that would happen simultaneously. See it as two brothers who fight in all the time, can I have both, something like that. They together make up the unity. And of course, this is similar to other philosophers we've taken up. But it's also very close to Graham Priest's glue on. It's interesting how existence, as he points to, can only be made up of what's impossible. And uh, 
trying to write a true book about true things if it goes overhand we make the whole book sort of slide and losing its energy in a, in a Don Quixotean crusade against imagined monsters because this I would say is an imagined monster and we can't even have a I have a lovely t-shirt, the Spartans, ah, yes, no Spartan. love them. It means, come and take them. The Spartans said to the Persians who wanted that they would surrender their weapons. <laughs> now, since we have speak, speaking uh, about the implied number eight, it should indeed be healthier if it would, so to say, think up this as a reverse eight, of course. As you pointed out, Hans, they belong together. It's impossible to separate them. And speaking about Stephen Fry, he, I would like to defend him a little bit. <laughs> he has made an excellent documentary about Richard Wagner. Mm. And there you have myth, Wagner's yeah. myths. And speaking of reality, he has problems with reality. That is the Nazi concentration camps because Hitler was a famous Wagner fan like himself. So both. Stephen Fry, who is a Jew, and also his op opponent, Hitler, adore Wagner. So he has a problem. So here you have, let's say reality, you have here Hitler, <laughs> and then you have here Wagner, Smith, and then you have the concentration camps, awful of course. Uh, Stephen Fry, and he, in this talk, when he goes out, uh, uh, Stephen Fry actually lost relatives in uh, concentration camps. And that's a reality. So you have the Wagner myth that through uh, Hitler enters. That's a reality. So I would say that you say that. Now, let's say that uh, I think that actually Sven <laughs> Fry prefers myth because he has written a book about myth. He loves Wagner, but he doesn't like our reality because you have here Hitler, you have the consternation camps. So I would say that he's struggling against the reality, I would say, because away with <laughs> consternation camps, away with Hitler's adoration of Wagner and so forth, and then Polish the mythos to make a pure myth, the, the pure Greek myth, pure uh, German myth with Wagner and so forth. So it's a complete, uh, complicated issue, but um, yes, we should make it there in the moment. Uh, in some way, so we should. Yes, I think that maybe Spain can um, help to heal the issue. And uh, also, since you mentioned gluon, gluon, which is related to English word glue, uh, it can help. There is a power that contractive power that puts them together, and there is also there is a lot of dynamic here. And, and uh, indeed, as you see, all of us make the cube. That's the reality. Of course, it includes also said elements that we have to uh, face. Back to you, Hans. Hmm. A very good comment. And I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the case. He prefers methods at time, at least. And it could be that this take means that you forever will be caught in this Bertrand Russellian constant flux of change, taking the other side and not being able to have the opposing side as friends or brethren. And maybe one day you prefer myth and then the other day you prefer reality. Uh, the thing I, that's just a rumor I heard, but it, it his crusade against Christianity seemed to be taken, maybe its feet in like the idea, if we stick to reality, we get rid of Hitler somehow. Because reality shows Hitler to be wrong for science. And that could actually cause a friction within the person himself. It's a sort of a schizophrenia where you'd be drawn in different directions. And of course, the objection to this is when you are here, you will do as Plato and Aristotle did towards Heraclitus. Couldn't see that 
oppositions actually pointed to unity. And diversity is individuality. It's things that needs to be, as Rosen said, you need to perceptively feel this. And it will take time to sort of heal it, to be whole again. And allowing this whole in your reality. And then you will see that that whole is not something negative. It is not something malign. It's benign. It's most definitely benign. But at a certain point, without knowing the nervous trip, you will feel, it could be feeling awful, I think. Uh, very good, thank you, Kalle, and thank you for viewing and listening in on this. Uh, it was a tough read, to be honest. Um, but I see how he tries to uh, sort of reach out and these things are not here to make it more complex it's actually the opposite mind seed all but once you touch them and you want, once you get to know them you see how your thinking takes opposing side and try to stick with one but look at the mervius when you try to stick on that side you will turn it will turn up that it is actually also the other side and the exclusion is the problem here, not the inclusion. Take both sides in and then you will have the wholeness. I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you.